The uh, scripture reading is John chapter 12, 12 through 19. This is the triumphal entry. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for these words. We pray that you would uh, sanctify us by your words and, and help us to believe uh, in you and your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, it's Palm Sunday, and... Uh, we're looking at one of the, the four texts that's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about Jesus riding into Jerusalem. We're looking at John. And uh, in my reading, I came across this interesting quote from William Cook. Up to this point in his ministry, Jesus had sought to keep his Messiahship quiet. Now he openly declared himself to be the Messiah who fulfills the ancient prophecies. I thought that was so interesting. I'm sure you've all read and heard those times when Jesus heals someone or casts out a demon and he tells the person, don't tell anyone about it or be quiet. Um, he, he, he doesn't want people to openly declare him to be the Christ. And there's several reasons perhaps why he does this. Um, and I, I don't have time to get into that now. But, but now, at this time, his hour had come. Now... Uh, shortly before the Passover feast in Jerusalem, Jesus publicly declares himself to be the Messiah. He is now prepared for all that that will bring about, okay, to be arrested and killed by the religious authorities uh, for, for this claim. And, and he's not afraid of them. I wonder if you and I would have been afraid if we were in Jesus' shoes or on his donkey, <laughs> And you might say to yourself, well, if I was God in the flesh, I wouldn't be afraid. But remember, Jesus did not take advantage of his divine power in order to protect himself or, or for his own personal benefit. That's, he, he set that aside uh, in his state of humiliation. And by this time, uh, the religious authorities, according to John eleven fifty seven, 57, it says... They had given orders that if anyone knew where Jesus was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. That was a standing order. And then here he comes riding publicly into Jerusalem, right? Um, so, so given this context, it was certainly a bold move for Jesus to ride into Jerusalem in that manner and receiving such praise from the crowds, okay, knowing what the religious authorities wanted to do to him. And, and uh, William Cook also noted the significance of riding on a donkey. And he, he writes, Centuries earlier, Solomon rode into Jerusalem on David's donkey to claim his throne. Right? The religious authorities would have remembered that. They would have recognized the symbolic significance of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Especially take that donkey along with what the crowds were shouting. Okay, according to Matthew's gospel, they were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Mark says they, the crowd was saying, Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. And John writes that they were saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the king of Israel. So no one could miss what these crowds were saying about Jesus. Jesus is accepting this praise. He is openly presenting himself as the son of David, the Christ, the king of Israel. And he didn't reject 
these words from the crowd. In fact, just the opposite. In Luke's gospel, um, it says that the Pharisees uh, in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered them, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. As if to say, nothing can stop all creation from giving me praise for being the son of David, the Christ. Okay? This made the religious leaders furious. They would stop at nothing now to have him arrested and killed. And Jesus knew this would happen. He knew full well that riding into Jerusalem like this would speed up the process leading to his crucifixion. And it's not like he was unaffected by this thought. Remember his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was arrested. Okay, uh, consider what it says in John 12, 27, what Jesus says. He says, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Okay, Jesus, he, he knew what was going to happen. And, and, and his soul was troubled about it. And yet... Even more than he was troubled about it, he was committed. He was committing for, committed to accomplishing the purpose for which the Father sent him into the world. What a good son. What a noble king. Okay? He was motivated by his love for his Father and also by his love for us sinners. He was committed to giving up his own innocent life so that everyone who believes in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. That motivated Jesus to do this. And we should keep all this in mind. Uh, think of this. When, when we, for instance, read the first phrase of John 12, 15, which is a quotation from Zechariah. Fear not, daughter of Zion. That's the people of God. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming sitting on a donkey's colt. The first phrase there is fear not. Well, why not? Why shouldn't we be afraid? The answer given is, is because your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. And so first, we shouldn't be afraid because your king is coming. And then we should also consider the manner of his coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Again, Cook writes, Jesus' entry on a donkey rather than on a war horse, suggests that he comes not as a militaristic messiah, but as the prince of peace. Okay? So Jesus has come to give us peace with God. Luke's gospel makes this even more explicit when the crowds are saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Okay, that, that, this is significant. There is, there is only one way for Jesus to make peace in heaven, that is, peace with God, and that is to suffer and die for our sins. His blood shed for our sins is what makes peace between us and God. And so fear not. In fact, rejoice greatly because your king is coming. He has come to put away sin once and for all by the sacrifice of himself, by offering up his own body and blood to turn away God's righteous wrath against us sinners. And so believers, fear not. You have nothing to be afraid of because King Jesus rode into Jerusalem in order to make peace with God. The only people who should have been afraid on that day and who should be afraid today are those who reject Jesus as their king, those who will not confess him as Lord or live their lives in allegiance to him. People like that have much to fear because as they reject Jesus, they are also rejecting his death for their sins. They will not benefit from his cleansing blood. John 3, 36 says that the wrath of God remains on those who do not obey the Son of God. Just consider 
um, how Revelation depicts Jesus coming uh, to judge and to punish unbelievers. <clears throat> Revelation 19, starting at verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Okay, notice now, Jesus is not riding on a donkey. He's riding on a war horse. I saw heaven open, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and he judges and makes war with justice. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses, wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God, the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. On the last day, you are going to want that guy to be on your side. <laughs> okay, because you, you will suffer the eternal wrath of God in fiery flames if he is not, if he is coming on that day to make war with you. And he could come any day. Any minute. The Bible says that his coming will be like a thief in the night. It will catch many people by surprise because they will be unprepared. Are you prepared? Are you ready for his coming? If thinking about this troubles you, if, if you're scared at the prospect of the second coming of, of Jesus to judge, I believe the Holy Spirit is calling you and beckoning you to get ready to be reconciled with God through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Because those who believe have nothing to fear. In John 5, verse 24, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. So for those of us who believe his second coming, it's going it's to be our final salvation. It will be a victory salvation, way more festive and joyful than that first Palm Sunday when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Hebrews 9.28 says that, that Christ, having been offered once to bear the sin of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. It's going to be an awesome day when our Lord and King Jesus returns from heaven to save us and to make all things new. He is going to make this whole world new. There's going to be palm trees. Uh, Revelation says there's going to be these trees uh, bearing fruit, 12 different kinds of fruit, each according to the different months. There's going to be a beautiful sea of glass. There will be rivers. Uh, there, there will be uh, a beautiful holy city, the new Jerusalem adorned as a, as, a, as a bride for her groom. In this city, there will be streets of gold. There will be gates somehow made out of pearls and precious jewels. Okay, And the greatest part, well, the second greatest part is that all creation will live in harmony and peace with one another, right? That the lion and the lamb, the, the, the wolf and the lamb will, will dwell together, okay? But, but the greatest part is that the Lord will be there and that we will see his face. And dear friends, young people, old people, you can live there in this new heavens and new earth. You can dwell in the new Jerusalem because 2,000 years ago, King Jesus rode into old Jerusalem on a donkey. And five days after that, he left old Jerusalem carrying his cross. And he did this in order to make peace between you and God. And so repent of your sins Believe in Jesus Christ who died for you and rose again. And now live for him as your king. Amen.